This is a bonus video because I've been asked to break down the theme of the 10 major D&D settings. I was trying to explain that each of the different settings had a different theme that would attract players of different tastes. Not everybody was familiar with all the settings, so I said I'd give a brief overview of what to expect in each setting. Not comparing them off of each other, I'm not saying one is better than another, though this page is called Welcome to Mastara, so you know which side I'm taking. So, welcome to this spontaneous analysis of the 10 major D&D settings. I'm Mr. Welch, and let's find you a place to play. Break the 10 settings down between the three catch-all settings and the seven standalones. By catch-all, I mean they have a large focus on multi multiplanar crossovers, and, and playing different characters from other settings isn't unusual at all. Those three are the Gothic Horror of Ravenloft, the otherworldly freak show that's Planescape, and the outer space-themed Spelljammer. All three of them can bring in characters from other settings, though with Ravenloft you can enter it easily, but getting out's a whole other matter. When it comes to the races and classes allowed, you can, you can feel free to mix and match. Now, the more traditional settings are the Kitchen Sink Forgotten Realms, the Extremely Political Birthright, the Post-Apocalyptic Dark Sun, the Pulp Fiction Heavy Eberron, the uh, Exploration Happy Mastara, the Epic Quest Heavy Dragonlance, and the very Game of Thrones style of Greyhawk. These range in background from traditional Western fantasy styles of Birthright and Greyhawk to utter alien like Dark Sun. Not all of them are going to have all the fantasy races in the handbook. Some of those races never existed in the different settings. Others have, are races that are long dead. So if you want to play a Drow, for example, you're not going to find one in Dragonlance, Dark Sun, Mastara, or Birthright. So keep in mind the setting if you want to play a specific race. So breaking them down in alphabetical order, first off we get Birthright, which was introduced at the tail end of TSR's Death Spiral, replacing the then-cancelled Greyhawk and Mastara. Birthright is unique in that you're playing the rulers of Scions of various kingdoms. You can rule kingdoms or other powerful agencies with greatly influencing the world around you. You're not going to be traditional adventurers. The setting has very much almost an Arthurian feel about it. You're going to be shaping the fate of nations rather than kicking in doors and looting dungeons. If you want a unique campaign with the players vying for the throne, this is your setting. Birthright probably has the least amount of playable races of all the settings. There's no orc, so there's no half-orcs. There's only a single type of elf called the Sedhelion, and uh, they're not very nice. Most of the elf types uh, that are gone are replaced with some humorless isolationists that don't like humans. Dwarves are still dwarves, halflings are there, but they have a darker bent. Goblins are a player race, they're not just randomly evil mooks just to be chopped up. And they do have some of their own, their own nations, but they're not very powerful. Gnomes, strangely enough, are present in the game, but they're not available as player characters. Most of the races stick to their own kind. A party with all sorts of different races is the exception. If you want to compare Birthright to a popular setting, think high-level Game of Thrones. You're playing Robert Baratheon, Ned Stark, Tywin Lannister, the High Sparrow, or the Faceless Man. You start off as a power player of one of the nations, and you're dealing more with politics and intrigue than dungeon crawls and fetch quests. If you want to play royalty or have an impact on your setting right from the start, check out Birthright. Dark Sun is one of the stranger settings because it's all about survival and just about everything you know about fantasy flies out the window. It's one of the deadliest settings, probably second only to Ravenloft. Metal armor and weapons are almost treasures by themselves. You're going to be fighting with bone weapons and carapace armor in a blasted desert wasteland. Seems some wizards destroyed the planet's ecosystem try to wage a war of genocide centuries past. Every player has a psychic power and typically you start off around level 3 because it's such a deadly setting. There's not many good guys in this one. The cities are controlled by slavers, and the entire planet seems to be a blasted wasteland. The setting has some really weird races to play. The half-dwarf mules and the enormous half-giants are strange enough, but most people remember the four-armed mantis-like Thrykreen as playable races. Because of the genocide that preceded the setting, there's a lot of dead races like trolls, gnomes, and goblins. Classes are also changed as Dark Sun's gods are dead or missing, so the clerics get their power from the elemental planes. Magic users have to choose between whether to cast normal spells and preserve the world around them or supercharge their spells and defile the environment, which is why the planet is mostly desert now. There's also the Psionicist class, which focuses all the psychic powers, uh, unlike the rest of the party that just have a small taste of it. It's a very strange setting with a lot of scantily clad gladiatorial combat, but when it comes to unique challenges, it's nearly the top of the list for D&D. There's no easy comparison to Dark Sun. Take a little bit of Mad Max, throw in bits of Gladiator, the Resident Evil movies, at least the later ones, and steal parts of Scanners and you've got Dark Sun. It's deadly. Like I said, you start off at third level to give yourself a fighting chance. It recommends you make more than one character. This is not a setting for people who like to get attached to characters. It's a challenge to make it from level to level. It features some of the toughest monsters in D&D. If you want over-the-top action mixed with some seriously beefed up bad guys, then you want to play Dark Sun. Then you get to Dragonlance, which was the setting that made D&D mainstream. 
It started off as the book series by Tracy and Laura Hickman, and TSR turned those wildly successful books into one of the most beloved settings TSR ever had, combining Tracy Hickman with Margaret Weiss as game designers. Most new players have no idea how popular Dragonlance was. It was the world of massive quests, with, world, with the world dealing with the return of both the gods and the dragons at the same time. It gave us the Draconians, which gave us the Dragonborn that we've got today, and they're, they're a lot nastier than the Dragonborn. There's a ton of background on the setting, and the world starts with the War of the Lands, and the rest of the focus is on the long-lasting aftermath of the war, with the dragons and the gods returning and disappearing and stuff like that. The book series was TSR's Lord of the Rings. They even made a full-length cartoon, but apparently they made it really badly. Dragonlance's impact on the D&D game was immeasurable. This was the setting that turned gnomes into tinkerers, only their gnomes took tinkering to the levels of madness. They replaced the halfling with the kinder, which were fearless, curious, and tended to be played like a kleptomaniac child uh, to the frustration of a lot of parties. The elves were divided between the Sylvanesti and the Qualanesti, which were the wood elves and the high elves. Actually, reverse that, they were the uh, high elves and the wood elves. Then there were no orcs, so there's no half-orcs, and there's no drow either. The Draconians were not a playable race because they were slaves to the Queen of Darkness and her minions, serving little more than elite moods for Takesis' glory. I say Dragonlance was TSR's Lord of the Rings, and I meant it. It's all about the epic quest. The books segue from one uh, quest to the next, never even pausing for the breath. First you have to uh, save the first cleric in memory, then you have to deal with the armies of dragons and fight in an epic war. As soon as one epic quest ends, another begins. This is high fantasy at its best. There's a heap load of background in all the nations. The last major setting that was introduced was the only one created entirely by wizards, and that would be Eberron. This one was actually created in a contest where everybody sent in their custom game worlds, and wizards picked Eberron out, and it became a really well-supported uh, setting. This is a pulp adventure setting with all the five e races present, but with twists. The world is very much steampunk and magitech with trains and airships, as well as magical conveniences in most of the cities. Eberron is recovering from a century-long war, and there's a lot of lingering animosity between the older nations and the new nations that broke away. The last war was a civil war over factions to control the ancient kingdom of Galifar. The war lasted so long that all the original claimants are dead, and only the destruction of an entire nation brought the war to an end. That's where the players find themselves. The setting is all about high adventure. It introduces the action point system, which gives players new economy to increase their odds or to use class abilities. Eberron encouraged players to go over the top with their concepts, but that also blurs the lines of the alignments as well. It's more about the adventure itself and letting the players handle the details on their own. One of the most major uh, unique facets of Eberron was the races. While they have the traditional races, they most famously added the Warforged, which are effectively sentient golems. They also gave us shifters in the psychic quarry, but twisted older races, so halflings now ride dinosaurs and drow live in deep jungles above ground. There are new takes on classes, like the Artificer class, that lets you build the steampunk devices. You're going to have to uh, read up on Eberron to learn all the new stuff, because they do greatly expand what's available. On to the 500-pound gorilla of D&D, the Forgotten Realms. This is the only setting currently getting love in 5th edition, and by love I mean more than one book. The realms proved to be the definitive setting as TSR moved its attention away from Greyhawk and Mistara to the uh, Forgotten Realms, right after Gary got forced out and took the rest of the Old Guard with him. So for large chunks of 2nd edition, until well, current day, Forgotten Realms got the most love, and it's definitely the most expansive setting because of it. I've tossed a lot of shade at Forgotten Realms because it's one of the only settings that TSR and Wizards has really shown any attention to, even when it went from a cliché to a joke. There's tons of background books and nations all over the place. It gave us the iconic Underdark, and when we think of Drow Elves, we think of the chaotic Good Rangers with pet leopards rebelling against evil kin. For a while, it was like every Drow was a good version of rebelling against the evil Drow to the point of you began to wonder if there was actually any evil Drow to begin with. When it comes to races and classes, the Forgotten Realms are the kitchen sink. If there's a playable race, it's going to be in the realms. If there's a playable race exclusive to another setting, just wait. They'll retcon it back to the realms. I'm surprised they don't have a kingdom with kinder, warforged, and phanatons yet. Every class is represented so much that the Forgotten Realms have bled their races and classes into other settings that did fine without them. So now we get players wanting to play Drow and Mastara, Chaos, Sorcerers, and Dragonlance, or demanding half-orcs and birthright. If you want to play some weird race, it's going to be in the realms. Everything else is in the realms. It's the black hole of D&D &D where they never met a rule they didn't like. Forgotten Realms as settings go is the default D&D &D world. The amount of material and background that's been released dwarfs all of the other settings combined. They say it's not the default D&D &D world for 5th edition, but so far we've only got one book that wasn't Forgotten Realms. Even many of the source books are written from a Forgotten Realms standpoint. 
When you picture a D&D equivalent of the Moss Eisley Cantina, you're thinking about the Forgotten Realms. They're secret societies galore, epic-level NPCs that make cameos in every adventure, and occasionally they show up and steal the party's thunder. Okay, more than just occasionally. If you like game worlds where everything is laid out for you, Forgotten Realms is the obvious choice. Now, the original D&D setting that was supported by TSR was Greyhawk. Don't give me any lip about Blackmore. We know Gary shoved Dave's world into a tiny corner of Greyhawk or into Mastara's distant past and completely forgot about it. Greyhawk is comprised of a massive amount of nations butted up right against each other, and they're not liking each other most of the time. The players represent the street-level heroes in a vast and complicated world. Birthright was represented by Cersei Lannister and Stannis Baratheon. Greyhawk is focusing on Bran and Gendry. The nations are mostly based on Western European ideals with lots of knights, but even the nations with the same overall alignment don't like each other. The parties tend to run around in the dungeon in the back streets while kings and regents act on machinations that will get the party's life really messed up and difficult, but only from afar. Greyhawk is a bit of a kitchen sink when it comes to races as well. These guys were the ones that gave us the drow, though their drows are so much better than the realm's drow because the Greyhawk drow are sporting awesome stashes. The only real race the Greyhawk has endemic to it is the Valley Elves, which are found in the Valley of the Mage, a minor location in the setting. The rest of Greyhawk has your typical gnomes, halflings, and elves, along with some of the new races like tieflings that are added on later after uh, Planescape introduced them. One of the flaws of Greyhawk is it does strike people as generic because what they are introduced to, everybody else took and made it their own. Like I said, Greyhawk is extremely political because it's massively tangled international spats. If any setting needed a United Nations, well, one that actually worked and wasn't filled with do-nothing corrupt bureaucrats, it's Greyhawk. The good nations mix it up with each other almost as they get entangled against the evil nations. The party's going to have to do its best to avoid getting caught up in the brush wars that seem to flare up on Greyhawk. Either they're going to be impressed into the military or executed as spies. With dark, gritty fantasy making a comeback, if you want to go with ground-level fantasy, there's also Greyhawk. Now, you all know where my loyalties rely, and that's Mastara. I will just rehash what I like about the setting and why you should play it so I'm not repeating myself too much. Star is the only setting that's based on real-world cultures on a massive scale. If you ever wanted to play a Maori warrior, a Flemish wizard, a Byzantine cleric, or a Mongol rogue, this is your game. More than any other setting except Birthright, this is the place built around world building. The players, as they progress, are going to be taking on more and more responsibilities as they become rich and powerful along the way. The star's other focus is exploration. It sits atop the pile of D&D settings in this category. Most of the nations have large areas that aren't settled. The areas around the primary setting are mostly wilderness. The party is going to want to explore those areas, find the lost temples, cities, and civilizations that are just waiting to be discovered. And then they get to become knighted in royalty and start their own kingdoms in those areas. Mastara was designed using the D&D rule set as compared to the advanced D&D rule set. As such, characters and monsters were greatly altered. What became standard for Greyhawk, the Forgotten Realms, and Dragonlance never, so never set foot in Mastara. Because D&D didn't have half-elves or half-orcs, neither did Mastara. Mastara introduced in its isolation a huge host of playable creatures like the Shi, the Pukas, Wood Drakes, Nagpa, Kana, Njatwa, and tons more. Mastara developed the Shadow Elves instead of the Drow. The Dwarves were three distinct subspecies, none of which were found outside of Mastara. Because it was similar in design to the other settings but different, a good chunk of the creatures in Mastara had different versions in the Safe Forgotten Realms. Effectively, Mastara is the Australia of Dungeons & Dragons. Because of its blatant historical versions of the human nations, Mastara is either really easy to sell as a setting or bloody hard depending on if your players love real-world history. If they want pure fantasy kingdoms, Mastara has a few, but remember, its, it's most iconic nation is based on 13th century Eastern Europe. The setting goes from uh, off-the-wall flying castles and full-blown magic item uh, shopping centers to straight-up Vikings and Mongols on the other end. If your players want to build their kingdoms from the ground up, spend all of their time looking for new places, or just love history, then your setting is Mastara. Now, Planescape is known as one of the best-written D&D settings, as well as the weirdest. It's a giant donut-shaped city located in the center of the multiverse that's divided up by over a dozen factions and ruled over by a silent floating entity called the Lady of Pain, who isn't a god but is no less powerful. The city is covered with random portals to other planes, making this the biggest sandbox setting in the game. When a door can take you to either a bakery or the quasi-elemental plane of minerals, you've got a large place to play. You can take a Planescape game literally anywhere, not just Sigil, but you've got all the inner planes, outer planes, and even the other settings if you want. Now, when it comes to variety, Planescape dwarfs every other setting, even the notoriously open Forgotten Realms. 
You can walk down the streets of Sigil, and you're going to be rubbing elbow, elbows with celestials, demons, devils, elementals, every mortal race you can think of, more than a few you can't think of, floating carpenters and only speak in rebuses, living streets and physical incarnations of the alphabet. If it's sentient and not a god, it's in Sigil. The lady doesn't tolerate gods in her city, and she's powerful enough to enforce that rule. In other settings, playing the most ridiculously diverse party is considered power gaming. In Planescape, it's considered Thursday. If you want to compare Planescape to another setting, you're going to have to grab some of the weirder sci-fi movies like Cities of Lost Children or Dark City. The weirder you can make Sigil, the better. The setting has its own slang. You can tell the people that played Planescape when it came out because they will speak the slang constantly. It's fantastically written. There's nothing like it that comes even close. But that's also its greatest weakness, because for people who want to play an elf fighter running through a dungeon, and you've got them running from Abishi under the watchful eye of a sentient iron golem that is hammering out weapons to be used in the end times, you're going to have a hard sell on Planescape. But if your players want to try a unique setting that is going to blow their mind, yeah, go with Planescape. Oddly enough, the catch-all settings uh, all round out the back. So next up we've got the D&D horror setting of Ravenloft, based on the classic module written by Margaret Wise, making this her second uh, entry into the settings list, and this is a greatly expanded setting from the, just Strahd's castle. The mists are still there, but now there's dozens of Dark Lords, each trapped in their own private hell that they are less than thrilled to share with you. Ironically, Lord Soth from Dragonlance was placed in Ravenloft against Weiss's wishes. Uh, Ravenloft is all about the horror. There's a whole host of monsters that will keep you up at night. Every intelligent evil creature is represented here, and a good number of spells don't work here that you really need. Oh, and you're trapped. There's no getting out of Ravenloft unless a Dark Lord lets you. And even then, it's not always up to them. Ravenloft is the second of all the catch-all settings, and I mean that catch quite literally. The Demi Plane of Dread can actually drag people from other planes into its domains. So visitors can be from any other setting, and when a Dark Lord is taken from another plane, it sets up the plane to contain people from that setting as well. Because of the unique nature of the setting, you can have any character from any setting of, of any race, all trying to escape the horror that is Ravenloft and trying to get back home. Each Dark Lord's domain is completely unique to the setting, so even native Ravenloft characters might have no cultural ties to the rest of the party. Now, the setting is all about horror. If you can think of a scary monster, Ravenloft will have a domain with it. Every type of undead you can think of. All sorts of lycanthropes, flesh golems, evil wizards, bloodthirsty warlords, mad scientists. They're all here. This is the world's worst prison as each domain is designed to torment the Dark Lord, but it traps a lot of innocent people as well inside the domain. And some not-so-innocent people. Evil is typically the alignment of the day. This is the deadliest setting by far because it's designed to trap characters in places they don't want to be. You can't kill the big bads. All you can do is thwart them, and if you piss them off enough, they're going to start taking it personal. If you like dark fantasy in literally every sense of the world, check out Ravenloft. It's a spectacularly well-written setting. So this brings us to Spelljammer, the last of the ten settings and the first of the catch-alls, uh, chronologically, where all the settings were linked together by high fantasy spaceships that could travel from planet to planet. So you could hop in your Spelljammer and go decide to get some dragon stakes on Kren before heading back to Earth and Greyhawk for the big war. Spelljammer was regarded as a nice concept, but the rules were very much is from TSR's silly phase. Opinions are still mixed on the setting because it gave us the really well-loved Niyogi and Gif as villains. In fact, they were just in some of the latest uh, 5e books. But it also gave us giant space hamsters, which powered gnomish ships with massive hamster wheels. If you want a very high fantasy nautical adventure, then Spelljammer is your only option. Now, Spelljammer is the narrowest range of the three catch-alls because it restricts itself to the pl prime material plane, unlike Ravenloft, and it has to follow the natural laws of the setting to get people into the story, unlike Ravenloft. So you can play a creature from any of the prime material planes, leaving out the extra planar Ravenloft and Planescape, and the deliberately hard-to-get-to planets of Dark Sun's Aphis and the uh, airless void that is Mastara's uh, setting. But you can still grab anybody from Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, Kryn, Eberron, or Birthright. If you can come up with a good story uh, why Dark Sun and Mastara aren't out of the realm of personality, of course, think of Spelljammer as D&D meets Star Trek. The rules for Spelljammers haven't aged well, but there are numerous fan sites devoted to fixing the massive plot holes and incompatible settings. This was the shortest lived of all the D&D settings, so there's a lot of holes to be filled in, but the fans have done a great job over the years. It's a setting that doesn't even try to disguise how over the top it is. You're flying a, gallon, a galleon through space. The art is iconic. The Niyogi spider ships versus the Illithid cuttlefish ships are almost immediately recognizable. If you want to mix sci-fi with your fantasy, there's no other setting that can even approach the level that Spelljammer sits at. If you're trying to fly from planet to planet to find new worlds to explore and or conquer, nothing touches Spelljammer. 
So that's a very brief rundown on all the settings and what their focuses are. There's sites online devoted to each one and finding them isn't hard. You have options when it comes to deciding on an established setting. Many of the settings need to be updated to the modern day. Greyhawk's low magic setting in a world dominated by warring state was considered boring until uh, Martin came along with Game of Thrones and showed us how to uh, actually run a story like that and make it interesting. So you're spoiled for choice. Talk to your other players and DMs to see what they want to play. Pick between Birthright's high-level politics, Dark Sun's bleak survival, Dragonlance's epic plot, Eberron's fast-paced adventures, Forgotten Realms' kitchen sink approach, Greyhawk's low magic intrigue, Mastara's exploration and world building, Planescape's interdimensional weirdness, Ravenloft's all-encompassing horror, Spelljammer's uh, otherworldly nautical feel. There is a setting that you will like, and if 5th edition would open up the remaining seven settings, that would be awesome.